Second and third trimester fetal ultrasounds are performed transabdominally and involve a head-to-toe evaluation of the fetus. The ideal time frame for performing the study is between 18 and 24 weeks gestation, since this is when major fetal anomalies are most easily visualized on ultrasound. Second and third trimester fetal ultrasound studies usually take between 30 and 60 minutes to perform. They can be divided into two halves. The first half is a general survey, and the second half is a detailed assessment of fetal anatomy. The first half is easier to do since our frame of reference is the maternal body. Not only does the mother do a better job of holding still, the orientation of the maternal anatomy is clear and fixed. Assessing fetal anatomy can be more challenging. The orientation of the fetus will vary and the fetus can move and change position during our study. The general survey begins with an assessment of the cervix. The cervix is the lower portion of the uterus and we carefully inspect it from the external os to the internal os. We measure the length of the cervix, which should normally be around three to four centimeters. We then turn our attention to the contents of the gravid uterus, beginning with the placenta. We identify the location of the placenta and check to see how close the inferior tip of the placenta approaches the internal cervical os. Placentas can be ex uh, anterior in location like in this pregnancy. Placentas can also be posterior in location, like in this pregnancy. Some placentas are low-lying. With low-lying placentas, the placental tip approaches but does not cover the internal cervical os. We'll describe a placenta as low-lying if the placental tip encroaches within two centimeters of the internal cervical os. In women with a low-lying placenta but without vaginal bleeding, we'll often consider doing a follow-up ultrasound during the third trimester. In this example, the placenta is posterior in location and its inferior tip is situated only a centimeter away from the internal cervical os. Sometimes the placenta may cover the internal cervical os in cases of placenta previa like in this pregnancy. Placenta previa occurs in about half a percent of pregnancies and can be associated with many serious complications, including maternal hemorrhage before or after childbirth, intrauterine growth restriction, fetal hypoxia, and fetal death. After inspecting the placenta for any other anomalies, our general survey moves on to an assessment of the number of fetuses within the uterus and then the fetal lie and position. With a cephalic presentation, the longitudinal axis of the fetus will be parallel to the longitudinal axis of the mother and the fetus's head situated inferiorly. With breech presentations, the longitudinal, longitudinal axis of the fetus will be parallel to the longitudinal axis of the mother, but the fetus's head will be situated superiorly. In a complete breech presentation, both of the fetus's hips and both of the fetus's knees are in flexion, and the fetus appears as if it's sitting cross-legged. In an incomplete breech presentation, both of the fetus's hips are in flexion, however, only one knee is in flexion while the other is in extension. In a frank breech presentation, both of the fetus's hips are in flexion and both of the fetus's knees are in extension. In a transverse fetal lie, the longitudinal axis of the fetus will be perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the mother. While in an oblique fetal lie, the longitudinal axis of the fetus will be diagonal to the longitudinal axis of the mother. An oblique fetal lie is usually unstable and eventually becomes one of the other three presentations. The next step in our general survey is to assess the amniotic fluid. Amniotic fluid surrounds and cushions the fetus and allows the fetus freedom of movement. This contributes to more symmetric fetal growth and helps keep the fetus's temperature constant. Amniotic fluid prevents infection and also helps the development of the fetal lungs, GI tract, and musculoskeletal system. Amniotic fluid constantly circulates, 
The fetus continues, continuously swallows it, urinates it out while in utero, and the cycle repeats. For this cycle to function normally, however, many things need to be working correctly, like the placenta, the fetal GI tract, fetal kidneys, in addition to the neurological activity required to swallow. An abnormally low or high amount of amniotic fluid can sometimes be a sign of an underlying problem. We quantify the amount of amniotic fluid using the Amniotic Fluid Index, or AFI. The AFI is the sum of the deepest vertical pocket of amniotic fluid, excluding fetal parts and umbilical cord, in each of the four quadrants of the uterus. In this example, we're measuring the amniotic fluid depth in the right upper and left upper quadrants, and then in the right lower and left lower quadrants. We call oligohydramnios if the AFI is under 5 centimeters or if any single amniotic fluid pocket is less than 2 centimeters deep. And we call polyhydramnios if the AFI is over 25 centimeters or if any single amniotic fluid pocket is over 8 centimeters deep. In this case, the AFI is 31.86 and the deepest pocket is 10.48 centimeters, indicating the presence of polyhydramnios. Polyhydramnios is often idiopathic. However, around 40% of the time, the cause will be maternal, such as maternal diabetes, renal, or cardiac problems. Fetal anomalies can be the culprit some of the time as well. And a few examples are illustrated here on this slide. We wrap up the general survey with an assessment of fetal viability using a tool called the biophysical profile. The biophysical profile assesses five parameters over a 30 minute window. Fetal breathing movements, fetal body movements, fetal body tone, amniotic fluid volume, and fetal heart activity or reactivity. Each parameter is scored on a two point scale and then they're totaled. Scores of eight and above are usually considered normal. The assessment of fetal anatomy begins with the fetal head and face. We evaluate the size of the fetal head by measuring its biparietal diameter and its circumference. We evaluate the lateral ventricles of the fetal brain and choroid plexus. We evaluate the cerebellum and cisternum magna. We measure the width of the cerebellum. We estimate the size of the cisternum magna by measuring the distance between the posterior margin of the cerebellar vermis to the inferior surface of the occipital bone. Distances over 10 millimeters are usually abnormal. We evaluate the fetal chin, lips, and nose to rule out clefts. And 3D ultrasound can be useful sometimes. Cleft lip is the most common facial um, malformation we'll usually see. The majority of cleft lip cases are usually isolated anomalies. Finally, we evaluate the size of the orbits and the distance between each orbit. We evaluate the upper palate too, looking for any evidence of cleft palate. Next, we assess the fetal spine. We check that each vertebral segment is present and appears normal. We also check to make sure that the entire length of the spine is covered by skin. To do this, we evaluate the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine from a sagittal perspective and also orthogonally in the axial plane. Our assessment of the fetal heart begins with evaluating its morphology and function on a four-chamber view. We measure the fetal heart rate, noting if the rate is either below 100 or above 180 beats per minute. We assess the right ventricular outflow tract and the left ventricular outflow tract. Our assessment of the fetal torso requires us to evaluate the stomach in two orthogonal planes, a sagittal plane to confirm the stomach's subdiaphragmatic location and an axial plane to confirm its sidedness.
we pay attention to the amount of fluid in the stomach. On a transverse image at the level of the stomach, we evaluate the size of the fetal abdomen by measuring the abdominal circumference. Our assessment of the kidneys begins first and foremost by confirming that two kidneys are present. We measure the lengths of both fetal kidneys, and then we measure the diameter of both renal pelvises. In this example, the left renal pelvis is markedly enlarged on transverse images through the left kidney, and also on a coronal image through the left kidney. Fetal hydronephrosis is the most common anomaly we'll encounter on fetal ultrasound, and sometimes a marker for aneuploidy. It usually occurs because something is preventing the free flow of urine downstream from the kidney. We assess the fetal urinary bladder after the kidneys, and then we'll evaluate the umbilical cord, which will be nearby. A normal umbilical cord has three blood vessels, two umbilical arteries and one umbilical vein. Remember that the umbilical vein carries oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood from the placenta to the fetus and the umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated, nutrient-depleted blood from the fetus to the placenta. The simplest way for us to confirm the presence of a normal three-vessel umbilical cord is to identify two superior vesicle arteries, which are usually visible on color Doppler imaging next to the fetal urinary bladder. With good imaging technique and a little luck, we can usually identify three vessels uh, within the umbilical cord on grayscale ultrasound imaging. And here's an example of the um, umbilical cord in cross-section. Then we check that the abdominal wall is intact at the site of the umbilical cord insertion. We encounter two-vessel umbilical cords about 1% of the time. Two-vessel umbilical cords are considered a soft marker for aneuploidy and will po uh, prompt us to check more carefully for cardiac and renal anomalies. If a two-vessel umbilical cord exists in isolation, however, they're usually of no clinical significance. Here's a grayscale ultrasound image of a two-vessel umbilical cord in cross-section and a color Doppler ultrasound image of the urinary bladder showing only one superior vesicle artery. We finish with an assessment of the fetal limbs, beginning with upper extremities. We evaluate the echogenicity, shape, and position of the humerus, radius, and ulna on both sides. We also evaluate how the upper extremities move. Hopefully, we also get to watch the fetal hands move and evaluate the fingers. Our evaluation of the fetal legs involves measurements of femoral length, Evaluation of the echogenicity shape and position of the tibia and fibula. And finally, the feet and ankles. This is the portion of the fetal assessment where we can catch anomalies like clubfoot. And that completes our overview of second and third trimester fetal ultrasound.